the scan. Oh, let me get rid of this here. Um, so let's take this case here. This is, uh, let's say this was last night, Jan, and you're on call and you get a call from your chief or fellow and you got a 37 year old male, trampoline injury, um, and uh, you know he's out celebrating a late Father's Day and uh, at the trampoline park and, and has this closed injury. So what do you think of this view? I mean, obviously you want probably more views, but this can kind of at least get the conversation rolling. Yeah, um, great question. So this, you know, this is a sagittal we're looking at from the side. I think the big thing is obviously we know it's broken or, or fractured. Um, and, you know, you could see the Taylor neck fracture. Um, and then, you know, the big thing though that I'm more concerned about, especially in the middle of the night is that the, the sub Taylor joint, it's not reduced. So here you see the posterior facet of the calcaneus. And then here you see the part of the talus. Yeah, so you have the, the fracture of the, of, the, of the talus, which is an issue, but then you also have the, the unstable joint as well. Um, so what do you tell, I mean, if, what are you telling them at this point? You tell them this goes straight to the OR? No, I'm having them try to reduce this. A lot of times you can reduce this closed, at least get a better reduction of the subtalar joint. Um, so the Taylor body, I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but you're not looking to get perfect. It just, it takes pressure off the soft tissues if you can get that uh, better aligned prior to going. I mean, this is going to the OR. I mean, it's going to get fixed. So, um, you know, but I think that that can help uh, temporize things. Yeah. Any, how do you, t I mean, when you teach in your residence, how are you telling them to reduce this? Yeah. Flex, flex, flex the, uh, flex the knee to, re to uh, release the gastroc. And then, um, you know, plantar flex, dorsiflex, uh, the, uh, the ankle at the same time. I, so, you know, some of the people that are um, on the call, maybe, I, I don't, when I, we were residents, Jan, do you think we would have taken this to the OR in the middle of the night? Yeah, so, I mean, that, 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 that's from Heather Valliers, a paper that showed, I, I believe it was her paper. Yeah. Um, that showed you that these are not necessarily surgical emergencies anymore, but you're right. When we were residents that I think that I forgot what year that paper came out 14, in right now. 2014. Okay. So now we would not take this in the middle of the night, but you know, back then, I mean, this was almost like a femoral neck fracture. Mm -hmm. Yep. It really was. I mean, I, it took a while to kind of shift that mindset, but, but thinking that, you know, whether it was displaced or not, or whether you could reduce it or not, that was something that needed to go urgently. And I think that practice has changed. Um, Absolutely. Thank goodness. Yeah. So kind of the questions, what to do first, why and how. Um, so your approach, your, you mentioned anterolateral approach. Um, you know, that's going just off the uh, kind of the, off the front of the fibula and then basically towards the fourth metatarsal kind of coming lateral to the extensor digitorum longus. Um, and that gets you a pretty good look at the, at the lateral aspect of the Taylor neck. And then there's an anteromedial approach, um, which comes kind of along the medial malleolus and then along the medial border of the foot. You kind of want to keep it in a point, place where if you needed to, you could always do a malleolar osteotomy uh, as well. Um, hopefully you kind of have that all planned out, but that's the general thought. Um, in terms of what you're going to see for incisions. Jan, you mentioned this before, but let's let's talk about it a little bit more, which is you're making two incisions, it sounds like, for pretty much all Taylor neck fractures. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and so can you talk us through why you're always making two? Why not just make one if you have a, have a good visualization of that? Yeah, great question. I mean, they, they do this in a kind of pretty well-known, like, uh, AO lab, you know, I think for residents and so forth, uh, but it's the talus, just because it's a three-dimensional anatomy, you can get one side looking almost perfect. And then if you actually look at the contralateral side, so if you get the lateral side looking great and you think you're, you know, you think you're well reduced, if you actually expose the medial side, you'll see how far off you are and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like, you always want a, a you know, multi-planar, uh, you know, or, or orthogonal films, right? Like there's always those memes that they show you where someone, it looks like they're, you know, uh, giving someone the bird, uh, yeah. but they're actually, actually not. 
And or sitting I, on the it, toilet or something. Yeah. It, it, so I liken it to like that. You just want multiple views and, and the talus is one of those um, bones that are, it's easily malreduced. Yep. I think that's a good point. And, and we'll talk a little bit more, you know, I'm going to do an oversimplified fracture here, but what oftentimes happen is, is the ankle gets, uh, is, is the force is inversion and dorsiflexion. And so what you see is comminution on the medial side. And in an ideal situation, it's a relatively clean fracture on the lateral side and then more comminuted on the medial side. And the reason this is important, kind of going back to this idea or concept of dual incisions, is that if you just fix it on one side, you can sh the tendency is to shorten that medial side. Um, and so that what that does then is it leaves you short on the medial side and leaves a foot in varus, which, you know, if you're lucky enough to not get arthritis and not get avascular necrosis, the last thing you want to do is then leave them in varus. Um, and it's because you've left them short on the medial side. And now they're walking either on the outside part of their foot or their, and then it locks up their joints as well. So we talked about this last, um, last episode, but, you know, talking about varus and valgus, and the way I think of varus is that the, the part that's kind of distal to the injury is going in towards the midline and valgus would be the opposite. So if, you're, if your heel's in valgus, it means that the calcaneus is swung to the outside. And if your heel's in varus, it means that the heel is swung to the inside. And, and when you bring it to the inside, part of the way the biomechanics of the foot work is that it locks up those joints and that's what it's supposed to do. But if you leave it in that position, now you really create a stiff foot. So if they're probably going to develop subtalar arthritis anyway. And now you've made the left the foot in a little bit of varus. And then that just locks up that foot even more. Jan, anything to add to that? No, I think it's just, it's very easy to malreduce these. So you just kind of, uh, you know, want to use your, uh, all the tools that, that are in your um, toolbox here you know, to assess your reduction, whether it be fluoroscopy as well as clinic, you know, clinically. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, this is kind of what the incisions look like. The image on the bottom right, I think is the lateral incision. And then the one on the bottom left is the medial incision. And you're seeing how kind of common it is on that bottom left with, um, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, loss of bone on that area. And the other one, you have a relatively clean looking read, uh, if you will, that, you know, gives you at least some, uh, somewhat of an idea of where you're going with it. And again, the injury is dorsiflexion and hind foot varus. So I mentioned this before, but you know, with, there's a dorsiflexion force and that can create some comminution on the dorsal side as well. So just being aware of that so that you don't dorsiflex your, your reduction. Um, so let's talk, can you talk through a little bit of your steps? I mean, I know that it kind of, every fracture is a little bit different, but beyond when you're approaching these, I'm assuming you're doing both approaches. So you can kind of look at both sides, which side do you start on? Do you side on, start on the lateral side? If you think it as if that's going to be a little bit better reduction read, or does it just depend on the fracture? Yeah, it depends on the fracture first of all, but I also will just do whatever is easier first. So that tends to be usually the lateral side. But I, I'm a big believer of doing what's easier uh, and getting a good read and then building off that. So usually laterally, and this is where I use a lot of times, you know, the fracture specific plates. So I, I like to use a Taylor neck plate, um, not all the time, but I do uh, have gone to using them, uh, you know, I would say the majority of the time. Sometimes I will cut a mini frag plate, though, if it doesn't fit, if the pre-contoured plate doesn't fit, but especially for the combinated fractures. I like using a pre pre contoured, uh, you know, some whatever company specific plate, uh, just to build off because then I, at least I have a template. Yeah. Now um, that those pre contoured plates, what sizes are those usually? I'm assuming that's usually what two o two four or something like somewhere. I, I believe they are. I mean, I, I think they might up go up to two seven. I think that maybe the Synthes one does, but I think they're usually around two four. Yeah, uh, 2024. And I think it's just, you know, you, you don't need a lot of strength here. It's more just, um, you know, you need something to help hold the reduction. So it's yeah. not like a you're, it's not like you're trying to plate a tibia or a femur. So if you um, have somebody that's prepping for this, this case, they know that's a Taylor neck fracture. Um, and, you know, it obviously, clearly you need a lot of K wires, maybe depending <laughs> on the trade. 
but clearly you need a lot of K wires. And so kind of all the standard four, five, six twos, maybe a two oh if you use it as a joystick uh, to help kind of uh, dial in your rotation. Um, and then um, and then having the mini frag plates is important. And then if you have fracture specific plates, that's helpful as well. Uh, and then screws as well. Like, let's just say, you know, in addition to the plates, do you want some screws available? Yeah, I use small screws, 2.0, 2.4, maybe a 2.7. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I've been using more and more in the Talus is um, sometimes uh, like, you know, the bio uh, absorbable screws okay. or pins, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, you, you tend to many times have a little bit of collapse and it's similar to the case that you posted, I think it was today or yesterday online on LinkedIn, uh, where you had a Taylor body fracture. Mm -hmm. And the I, I've seen a lot of those that like they heal, they tend to heal. I, I, that's not the issue, but there's sometimes a little, you know, collapse. So where that screw you thought you sunk into the cartilage mm -hmm. um, is now a little bit more prominent and removing those at a later time are it's much more difficult. Um, so I think some of these bioabsorbable screws and pins and and so forth from different companies, I, I think there's a few different manufacturers now. I think they could be a helpful tool for this. Do you ever use those, um, there's those bone? Uh, I've not bone. used that particular, I've used the Osseo ones. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because there's another company too, because um, I don't know if it's like, they, they call it like the shark bone or something. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. I've remember. seen it on I've seen it on LinkedIn, but anyways, yeah, I, I I've used it a couple times and I've been happy with it. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, let me go back. I wasn't done with that thought, I don't think. So we got the um, so your lateral approach is probably going to be best for your direct reduction. The medial side is going to be sometimes a little bit more comminuted. Uh, sometimes they're both comminuted and it's just, it's hard uh, to get. Um, we talked a little about this a little bit already, um, which is, uh, you know, mini fragment plates as fracture specific plates. And then, um, and that's been, been well described. In this case, it looks like it was a, probably a two, four, I'm guessing, based off of the size of those screws, two, four plate on the lateral side. Um, can you talk a little bit about your interoperative x-rays, Jan? Here we have what we you know, refer to as a uh, canale view, but can you talk about using that? Yeah, I think that, you know, that view on the bottom, like you said, a canale view, um, it gives you a, a good view of the Taylor neck. Um, and I think, so that, that's that been very helpful. And then on the lateral view, which is right above that, uh, one of the key things, uh, once again, is um, I will look at the reduction of the sub Taylor joint. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, also the Taylor navicular and the tibio Taylor. I want this all to be concentric mm -hmm. and, you know, cause it, you can, a lot of times I think give you, give an idea if you're off somewhere, if those joints are not concentrically reduced. So uh, that's what the, those are the couple of things that I'm looking at, looking at particularly during a case. Yeah. Um, on the medial side. Uh, you know, we sometimes we talk about using more position screws as opposed to compression screws. Is that is that how you approach the medial fixation? Yes, and you know what Nick is saying here is we we should uh, talk about the difference between those. But yeah, so these are positional screws. They're just almost they're not even lag screws. They're just screws to hold out something to length. Uh, they're just put in, you know, whatever. If they're like, you know. Three five screws. They might be, you know, you drill with a two five or two six drill bit, depending on the, I think the, you know, the company. Um, and because you do not want compression, as you can see here, there's a little space in this bone here, or in the fracture, and that's probably because there's comminution. So, um, but those are positional screws on the medial side. There's really very rarely can you put a plate on the medial side of the talus because yeah. of the impingement that you get um, with other structures such as like the medial malleolus and so forth. If you can um, get one there, it's like two holes and it's super short. <laughs> yeah, you could put a very small plate, but uh, you know, most companies don't make that, right? They, but you know, most companies will make that, you know, the uh, Taylor neck plate as you see here, um, nicely used. Yeah. Uh, so this is just another example here. I think it's a little different case, but you can see on the lateral side, I think this was actually a 2-0 plate and then 
a separate screw in the lateral process and then position screws on the medial side. So is and, this your case, Nick? Yeah. Man, those staples would drive me crazy. Yeah, you know what? That was, <laughs> that's funny that you mentioned Is that, that the old Nick? No, that is actually when you do this with your partner and uh, this is... <laughs> And I think they closed. So, and and I'm curious. You know, I've seen a lot of stuff now, a little bit at least on LinkedIn. You know, being advertised or promoted is some of those, I guess, wound closure devices, not a like a wound vac, but those su suture guard or something. Oh yeah, the suture oh. guard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, have you had any experience with it around the foot and ankle? Because that's only to be from their a focus only, right now. Only from a perspective of saying, like, you know, when so, I've had some people close some wounds and they leave these tiny little bridges between the skin. And what I've noticed is if I go um, a little wider, you know, away from the more traumatized skin, mm -hmm. uh, it really helps. I think even the even the distribution of the of the force. And so I'll actually now you do more just a kind of a simple running baseball stitch, but I keep them pretty wide off the skin. And that actually heals probably as well as anything. That's just anecdotal. Don't, uh, I'm sure there's like some, you know, randomized paper out there, but, but staying, you know, staying away from those stitches that are so close to the skin. So I think there, I think there's, um, it's warranted. It's a, it's a reasonable discussion to have um, that, that, that's spreading out that distribution and, and taking the tension off that skin that where the incisions made, um, has carried some weight. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. I've not tried it yet, but I, I am curious for some, I would say high risk wounds or even like below knee amputation, you know, where, where you're yeah. seeing a lot of wound issues yeah. at baseline, but and this nice. is like follow up at I think six months or so, you know, so to Jan's point, you know, developing some subtalar arthritis in this case, uh, you can see, clearly see there's a little bit of wear and tear um, here healed, I, you know, no signs of AVN, um, but uh, some, some, time, some signs of subtalar arthritis. And I would consider this a, a good result, you know, for this person It healed back active working on their feet, that kind of thing. Agree. Nice job. Um, okay. We talked a little bit about the medial side. I won't beat it to death, but just remember that you're using position screws. So, you know, if you see that they're not lagging on the medial side, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. If you're in a case with the surgeon who is just, uh, doing, say it's a two seven and you're using a two O drill bit, you're not going to use a sliding screw, uh, on the medial side. 